seriously, a medium risk. All I'm doing is getting data from the environment. What's the problem? A few things. Like what? The code isn't validating the data, and this untrusted data is controlling the way the app works. If it were modified by a malicious user, it may compromise the workflow. It will never happen. Fine. So what's the fix? Let's look at how we can make using system.getEMV more secure. First, let's take a look at the two forms of invoking system.getEMV. To do that, we'll write a short app that prints out the value using printf. We use the %s and %n format string to print the results of the call to getENV along with the newline character. We use the first form of getENV where we supply it with a key to look up and return us the value. In our example, I've already set up a custom key called my environment variable that I'll be using for testing. Let's run the code, and our result is the value associated with our key. In this case, it's some value 01. Now let's look at the second form of invoking getENV. In this form, instead of giving it a key to look up, it returns to us a map of all the key value pairs currently in our environment. Then we'll use the foreach method on the map interface to iterate through all the key value pairs. We'll pass the foreach, a lambda expression, to print out the key value pairs. Let me know in the comments if you'd like to see some videos about lambdas and streams. Let's run that code, and we see a list of all the key value pairs currently in our environment. That's great, but it's a bit hard to sort through. So let's look at how we can use streams and lambdas to search our list of results. This code is a bit complicated, so let's take it a piece at a time. First, we'll call system.getENV, which returns the key value pairs of our environment variables. Next, entry set is a method on map. It returns the key value pairs in the map as a set. Next, we call stream. This method is called on the set and converts the set to a sequence of elements that we can process either sequentially or in parallel. Next is a call to filter. It takes a lambda function that returns a Boolean value. The filter call will keep only the elements that return true in the lambda function. In this case, we're looking only for the keys in our set that are the strings path or java home, regardless of case. The values that were found that match this condition are passed to the for each method. And here we use the lambda function once again to print out the results. Let's run the code. And we get the values from our environment. First is the value for Java home. Next is the value for path. So we know how to get the results with getENV and how to filter the results using modern Java syntax. Now let's take a look at some techniques we can use to validate the data we get from the call so we can keep our application secure and make our partners in application security happy. We'll return to the simple call to get the value from my environment variable from the environment and save it to a local variable called env variable. The first check we'll want to put in place is to verify the value is not null. This might happen if our environment's not set up properly or if the name of the key we're searching for is wrong. Of course, a bad guy might clear this value so our app fails with the null pointer exception. Let's not make it easy for the bad guys to break our code. <laughs> Let's add on to this check with a regular expression and pattern. We'll add or, our environment variable doesn't match a pattern. And for our pattern, let's walk through it. First, the caret symbol means we start at the beginning of the string. The dollar sign means we go to the end of the string. In between, let's add brackets and a plus character, so we'll repeat the bracket pattern for every character. In the brackets, we'll add lowercase a through z, uppercase a through z, the numbers 0 through 9, and then underscore and dash. The overall expression returns true if the environment variable is null or if it doesn't match our pattern. This pattern will be considered a whitelist or allow list, meaning these are the characters we'll accept. Everything else is rejected. Then in our code, let's print some messages. In the fail condition, we'll print the message missing environment variable with environment conveniently misspelled. And for the else case, we'll print the message passed along with the value we got back with a new line. Let's run the code. And we see our message pass the checks. Now let's look at how we can validate against a fixed set of acceptable values. We'll start with the environment variable lookup. This time, we'll add a set of strings called allowed values. Let's set it equal to a set of string values that we'll accept. 
Once again, by doing this, we're setting up a whitelist or allow list, but in this case, for a very specific set of predefined values. We'll make the values some value 01, some value 02, and some value 03. Then in our validation code, once again, we'll check to see if the value is not null and if the value we got back from our call to get env is in the allowed list. If that's true, we print a success message along with the value we got back. If we run that code, we get the success message along with the sum value 01 value that we've been using in these examples. Now let's see how we might want to use the length checks on our data. In this case, let's create a variable called min length and assign it a value of 8. We'll create another variable called max length and assign it a value of 50. Then our validation check, we'll check to see if the value we read from the environment is null, and then if the length of the value is less than our min value or greater than our max value. If one or more of these conditions is true, then we print a failure message, else we print a success message. So let's run that code, and we get the success message. Keep in mind this length check can be combined with the earlier regular expression checks that we were doing to make our validation even more robust. Now let's put it all together. In our last example, let's use what we've learned to create an inline sanitizer method. First, let's create a list that will contain the strings we'll call sanitized values. And let's set that list with a call to system.getENV. And we'll call entry set like we did earlier to give back a set of key value pairs from the map returned as a set. We'll turn that set into a stream so that we can perform functional operations like filtering, mapping, and reducing. Then we filter the stream using a lambda expression. In the expression, we search for keys equal to Java home regardless of case. The use of the map function is new here. The map function uses a lambda expression that calls a method we haven't written yet called sanitize on the current value in our stream of key value pairs. The sanitize method will clean up the data before we process it. The collect method is also new. It gathers the sanitized values into a list of strings that we can assign back to our sanitized values variable. The purpose of this code is to take the untrusted data stored in the environment variable, run it through a sanitizer, and then save it for processing in our sanitized values list. Code like this will delight any AppSec analyst or static analysis tool. Now let's write our sanitize method. We'll make it public, static, and it will return a string and take a string argument that we'll call input. If input is null, we'll return null. You might want to do something different in your code, but that's your call. Then we'll return a sanitized version of the input with a call to replace all, where we'll add a regular expression. We'll start with square brackets to define a character class that will match any single character in the brackets, and then add a plus so the pattern will be repeated for each character. Now let's add a caret character. Adding it here makes it a negation operation. This means a character match will occur for any character that's not listed in the brackets, which means if we find a character not in the list we're about to specify, then we'll replace it with some other character as we'll see in just a moment. Then we list the good characters we want to match. They include both upper and lower A through Z, the numbers 0 through 9. Now we'll list the remaining characters that we want to keep. They include forward slash, double backslash. Notice we have to escape the double backslash with backslashes, which is why we need to enter it four times, then a colon, a semicolon, and a dot. We have to escape the dot with slashes since it has special meaning in regular expressions. And finally, we'll replace any character not in this list with an empty string. Once again, we've created a whitelist or allow list, so no untrusted characters are allowed. Back in our main method, let's print out the Java home value now that it's been sanitized. We'll create a for each loop. For each value in the sanitized values list, we'll simply print out the value. So let's run that code, and we get back our current value for Java Home. There are no bad characters in a string, so we can't tell if our sanitized method is actually doing anything. Let's go back to our code and remove the two slashes and the period from our regex to see what happens. Now let's run the code with that modification. Now notice in our output, 
the sanitized version of Java Home has the periods removed, proving that our method works. All right, go forth and secure your environment data before you use it. Make your application safer. Thanks for watching, and remember to always begin secure.